It's another hype train and that means it's time to pull on the dangly <laughs> string thing in trains. Yeah. I'm going to Google what that is for the next episode. Uh, and it's time to taste not only beer from one of the greatest breweries on earth, a brewery owned by some of the most lovely people on earth, but also a beer, particularly in Pliny, that has a lot of history with the craft beer channel. Yeah. We, we, it was probably the first video that got quite a lot of views for us, right? Yeah, it got a little bit of traction. I feel like I had a really good hat on as well. So Did I'm, you? I'm, I'm thinking it was the hat probably that brought the viewers. We'll, we'll, we'll fact check that. <laughs> but it was also one of the first big trips we ever did. We went out uh, to Northern California. We went to Santa Rosa and to San Francisco. Uh, and we were privileged to interview Vinny and have done a couple of times since. Yeah. Um, for our feature length documentary with, um, with Siren on Time Hops and also for our own homebrew episode in which we tried to create our own twist on Blind Pig. And today we're going to be tasting their two very famous hoppy beers. They do, of course, make amazing Belgian style beers as well, but um, couldn't get hold of those. So we're going to have these bad boys. So let's start with Blind Pig. And while we drink that, I'll tell you a little bit of the history of Russian River Brewing Co. So Vinny, he's a man, he doesn't seem to have aged. No. In all the time we've known him. When, when do you reckon he started brewing? What year? Well, I've had a little look, so I kind of oh, know. Oh, have you? You've done some research. Done okay. a little. No, well, I wouldn't call it research, Johnny. <laughs> I skimmed. Quick I Google. Skim, I skimmed red. <laughs> 1997. Well, that's the start of Russian River Brewing ah, Co. I don't know what, what year he started brewing, Johnny. 1994, down in, down in Temecula, San Diego County, he Great founded name. founded Blind Pig Brewery. Of course he did. And was brewing there for a couple of years before he got, I guess he got poached uh, yeah. to move up to Northern California and run the Russian River Brewing Company in 1997, which was part of a champagne maker's yeah. estate. That's crazy. Corbel. Corbel Cellars. Yeah. Wow. So they, they've been making champagne in that region for, like, at that point, nearly 200 years. In that part of in, in that part of Northern California, no I mean it's way. wine country. It's wine country. So but can they county. call it Calif They call it champagne. Yeah, because they're not part of the EU. They don't have to conform yeah. to these rules about what you can and can't call stuff. Um, so they were making champagne, and they got him in. I think the brewery was already there, and he turned up and basically revamped it and, and yeah. got it really going. And in 1999, brewed the first ever commercial double IPA, which we will get to in in a bit. But he still had this IPA, which I believe is based on something he brewed down in Southern California. Amazing. So should we have a taste of this beer that comes from all the way back, to some extent, from 1994. 30 years ago. 2000. Yeah, when you put it like that, yeah, 30 years ago. Amazing. Wow. And it smells timeless and modern, right? Fresh as a daisy. Yeah. Grapefruit and orange peel. Quite, quite zesty. Not, not that much kind of, I was expecting a bit more pine and something mm -hmm. like that, but it, it's very zesty. Zesty, it's kind of light. Yeah. Ugh. Cleaner, brighter, crisper than most lagers you'll drink. Incredibly clean profile. Sublime. Lovely zesty kind of character. Real pine coming through and then like bitter, really bitter orange peel on the finish. Vinny's the man. Yeah. It's a, it's a lightning quick beer. It feels like almost like, like we've been filming about West Coast Pilsners. It feels a little bit like that. It's that clean and that fresh and almost no kind of caramel Munich or any kind of character like that. It's almost like all pills the malt kind of thing. Six and a bit percent, Johnny. That's quite light for him, isn't it? <laughs> it's quite light for Vinny, but it's, um, I mean, it, it's almost hard to describe how we use dialed in quite a lot in the beer industry. And it's to talk about, you know, really crisp, clean profiles about really obvious hop character mm. so you've you've gone for grapefruit and you've nailed it just everything is is on point and clearly you can see that 30 years of research and development and endless batches and learning has not gone to waste it's like a racing car firing on all cylinders this yeah it, and and like just being a perfect machine to convey uh good times to your mouth so this is like, uh, it's classic hop variety. So it's like, it's Cascade, it's Chinook, um, it's Centennial. Um, I think there's a little bit of Amarillo in there. Um, and I believe from the interview that we did with him, he's also kind of peppering, sprinkling, salt baying, little bits of citra, bits Ooh. of crystal in there, like trying to get some slightly modern character out of it, which I think is all that zestiness. Yeah. That's coming through like a real pop of grapefruit from citra to try and make this beer 
well, not to try, to entirely fucking succeed, Vinny, to make this beer still feel modern. We're, we're doing a hype train, but this is like an old beer that still tastes amazing and current and like, you know, of today. Yeah, well, we, I mean, we should say that this recipe, and Vinny's very open about this, the recipes of both these beers have changed yeah. over time quite significantly, but only ever in small yeah, quantities. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Citra wasn't even released as a commercial hop until 2009. So nearly 15 years after this was brewed. So Wild. new stuff is going in. You know, the bitterness has probably been played around with. Vinny is famous for coining the term lupulin threshold shift, <laughs> which is, is his, uh, his way of explaining that as you drink more and more bitter beer, your palate gets more attuned to it and more desensitized to it, to the point where a beer like this, which is robustly bitter to our now New England IPA weaned palates, very, very bitter. Yes. And he's probably had to, you know, maybe recently he's had to temper it. Certainly back in like the sort of 2010s, he'd have probably raised it because everybody's getting very excited by that because of that lupulin threshold shift, which is my new prog album, album by the way. Um, and he, he maybe he's brought it down a little bit. He's added a bit of citra because he realizes that people want that really zesty aroma. So it is a classic, but it's updated. Yeah, so he's, he's kind of... Um... He hasn't, he's never rested on his laurels and he's always kept with what people want. Yeah. Which is like, that's, that's the sign of an amazing brewer, right? You, what's the point of making something that's, that, that never evolves, never changes, uh, if no one wants to drink it? Yeah. So like to move with the times is very progressive. Uh, and I think we, we often think, you know, people that have got, you know, heritage like 30 years in the game, maybe they're a bit closed-minded, but... That's certainly not a closed mining beer. Um, well, if, if we thought that was good, shall we drink a beer that is still today, still, what, what are we, not 25? Yeah, 25 years after it was first brewed, regarded as one of the best IPAs in the world. And it's going to be crystal clear, folks. Crystal clear. So I think we maybe over, overused the word legend or legendary, but... This is a legendary beer, Johnny. Yeah. In that it kind of invented a style all in of itself, right? Yeah. So it wasn't a double IPA before this. There, there was no, no such thing. I mean, they didn't even call it, I think it would have been called an Imperial IPA. Imperial IPA, yeah. Back at the time. So Imperial historically just meant the strongest version of whatever style you were brewing in sort of English brewing. And so this, was, this is what, that's an accurate way of calling it. It was the strongest IPA he made and it was the original double IPA, 8%. And he actually even had to use English techniques to get it that strong and tasty. So there's sugar used in this brew to get to 8% without using um, loads and loads of malt, which can result in, you know, stickiness, sweetness, more body, more character that will overpower the hops. Mm. You use sugar, you can get to that ABV and keep it crisp and light and fresh, which isn't done with this one. Wow, that really went. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So this is Pliny. I have not had this. Oh, maybe since we were out there. No, we had it in Pennsylvania, 2019. And I drank it when I was in San Francisco. Oh yeah, you went quite recently, didn't you? In, at the end of 2022, beginning of 2023. Yeah, it's all right for some. Hooah. So this beer for me sings Simcoe. Mm. Simcoe would have been a brand new hop. In fact, when Vinnie brewed with it, Simcoe was still in its HBC number. So it's the hop breeding company got there in the end and then it would have had a bunch of numbers after it. So Simcoe was not like a commercially grown hop. They hadn't named it yet, but he was using it to incredible effect in here. And it's got that creme caramel rich sweetness and then it's got that juicy fruitiness and then it's got that lovely, lovely fresh pine uh, herbal quality to it on top of like Centennial Columbus, I think it's bittered with, and maybe a bit of Amarillo as well for some zestiness. It's just a gorgeous, rich and complex aroma. You know, it's nearly 2% stronger, but it's got a similar body, similar finish, similar crispness yeah. to the blind pig. But it's got a bit more malt sweetness, which is coming from like a touch of Munich in this, I think. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit of alcohol naughtiness as well. Just a little bit though. Just, just about reminding yourself that this might not be the 6% you think it you, is. You might fall off your bar stool yeah. uh, after you've eaten some pizza in the 
That was excellent, wasn't it? Let's just talk about that. I mean, that, the, the original brew pub is yeah. fantastic. I drank... I think one of the worst hangovers I've ever had was afterwards because I, exa- I forgot that it was 8%. It doesn't drink like an 8% beer. several pints of it. And we... You can go... They did a happy hour, didn't they? I think all the beers were like four dollars. Yeah, or four dollars on a Sunday for Insane. a pint of Pliny. Amazing. Like it doesn't get any better than that, and then it shortly afterwards doesn't get any worse than that. <laughs> Often with a hype train, we come in cynical. You know, we come in going, I don't think this is going to be the best beer in the world, or the best hazy IPA in the world, or even close. And a lot of the time, we are surprised. This one, I came in new. I came in worried I was going to be disappointed, because obviously this isn't the freshest. It's come from America. Yeah. But it still tastes absolutely insanely good. Yeah, and sure I would does. choose this beer over any other West Coast IPA in the world every time. Yeah, I think I, I tend time. to agree. It's the mark of excellence in in this field, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's the benchmark that everything should be judged against. Incredibly clean. The the other thing to about is is the bitterness because the bitterness is even now still clawing at me but at no point is it too much and when you've got that amount of bitterness and it's building over a whole bottle of this it should become too much but it never does mm. which you know you could say it's a kind of alchemy how's he doing that but it's it's science and it's batch after batch dialing 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 it in um to the point where you can have something that is dries your entire face out <laughs> and you just want more of it i love that they're still in the bottles, the brown bottles. It's very romantic somehow. But it, it, it's of a different era, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this, they haven't switched a can. This was done on. Well, they do. They, they do, do can beer. They do can beer. There's, can beer, there's a yeah. DDH version of Pliny that comes in a can, but the original will always be in the tall bottle. Yeah, I love it. With the label that was clearly made in, in MS Paint, as far as I can tell. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of like resolutely. Uh, unchanging in their design. Yeah, to use like an Englishism, like the, it, it's the kernel approach. It's just unrepentant in its yeah. simplicity. I think it speaks of confidence, Johnny. That yeah. you know, they know their product is great. They know they've got a great brand. They don't need to change the, it. The marketing is almost irrelevant. It's it doesn't like, matter. This will sell. It sells itself. I'm going I'm to play devil's advocate for a second, like because I do think that people coming to the beer industry, particularly people that have come to craft beer since hazy IPA became a huge thing, might sniff those aromas and be like, it's a little bit muted to what I expect. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the bitterness might potentially be an issue, but a lot of the, we say this quite a lot, you know, the changes that you'd want to make to attract those people would mean entirely ruining what's great about, about your beer. So I think maybe for the first time, the hazy IPA, the haze train, has made this a slightly acquired taste. But for people like us, and I think for people in future, because craft beer, is a, it's a cycle, it's fashion, it will come yeah. back around to these styles of beers. You know, Pliny's just sat there waiting for those hazy drinkers to, to come around to it. Um, and, you know, I think as a beer, it's technically flawless. And there's not many beers I say that about, um, even, even when it's, what, two months old, I think. Um, but that doesn't mean that everybody's going to love it when they come to it. And, and I think a real mark of its quality is the fact that its reviews, you know, on Untapped or whatever it is, Rate Beer, have, you know, hasn't seen a decline, despite the fact that lots of people will come to it expecting mm. the aromas and the flavours they get from modern IPA. You know, people are tasting it and going, wow, that's still stunning, which might not be the case of, say, Stone IPA 2.0 or... Sierra Nevada torpedo, like they might be disappointed by that, but you just you can't drink that and not be stunned by it. So it's almost transcended the hype train, Johnny. Yeah, and it is a it's a it's a classic. It's a hype plane. It's a hype looking plane. down on us all. Higher plane of <laughs> a higher a hi- plane. A higher plane of hype. <laughs> so I think a really interesting question to ask at the end of a hype train about Russian River is: so these guys have been brewing, and you know it's, it's a whole team. It's not just Vinny, obviously. They've been brewing one of the best IPAs in the world since 19, in this case, 1999, right? So 25 years of Pliny. When we look at the other hype trains that yeah. we've done, I mean, Heady Topper is at uh, nearly 20 years. In fact, it just celebrated 20 years uh, start, uh, at the very end of last year. You know, that, that's a timeless beer that will, will probably never be beaten in its, in its class. But everything else, you know, we look, you know, we've done... 
done Trillium, we've done Treehouse, we've done Hill Farmstead. Are those beers, are we going to be looking back in 30 years' time at those and going, these are classics? You know, we, we can't underestimate how tough it is to be at the top of IPA brewing for yeah. that long. But it must be the most stressful thing, almost being like, you know, Atlas holding up the world <laughs> with the best, the best in its style and having invented a style, mm. essentially. Well, I mean, a man's a one-man dynasty. I, you know, I hope, he, I hope he lasts another 30 years, Johnny, as an individual and keeps brewing so, all so the way. Your answer to my question is probably not, but Vinny might still be going in 30 years. I hope years. so. <laughs> I hope so. I really hope so. As an organisation, they seem impervious to the rest of the world. And, you know, the sort of stress factors that a lot of uh, older breweries might go through where they get acquired. You know, maybe the founders get older or they, they just want to sell out at some point and like live the high life. Um, 30 years he's been going strong and he's still manning the ship. Yeah, you know? he, he, and he still brews. You know, I think that's an important thing to point out. There was, there was a time when we approached him to do some work and he was like, I can't because there, there's enough people off work at the moment that I am literally shift brewing. Wow. You know, and that, that blew my mind when I got that reply. Um, but that's how involved he is, and that must be part of it, you know, as well. That the person that had the vision 30 years ago is still, still part of that vision and not sort of stepping away or having to run the business. Um, it's, just, it's a model for breweries starting and for even breweries that are 20 years old, you know. Um, and in terms of inspirational, actual liquid, actual beer, when it comes to hoppy styles, I don't think... I mean, lots of locals, I think, prefer this, but I think that's out of self-preservation yeah, <laughs> this yeah. is 8% I, I just I can't get over how good this beer is and continues to be um, and you know those little tweaks just maintain maintain its relevance and also a little bit of surprise every time you drink it um, so thank you Vinny for doing what you do um, as expected the hype train rumbles on when it comes to Russian River I'd gladly I'd gladly stop at Russian River yeah. anytime the train pulls in. Well, hopefully we will soon. Cheers. <laughs>